Amen. How y'all doing tonight? Amen. Praise the Lord. It's always a privilege, amen, to be around y'all wonderful folks, amen, and to be here in the presence of the Lord, amen, even on a Wednesday night, amen. And uh, God, God is good. Can somebody say amen to that? And, uh, you know, even in the worst of circumstances, even when it just seems like, uh, when it seems like things just ain't going right, God is still good. Amen. How many can say, man, God is, look at your neighbor and say, God is good. And, uh, you know, one thing I've learned is that it even, and I think I've mentioned this before on my worst day when it just seems like all hell is breaking loose in my life or things just ain't going right, man, God is still good. Amen. So he is awesome. Amen. In this place. Amen. So Sunday, be a part of that. It's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, I do want to say that if you do come in here with your Tom Brady jersey, because uh, we showed a video of him on Sunday, uh, we will lay hands on you. <laughs> Not spiritually, amen? No. You know, I, I've told people this. I've never been a, a, a Patriot fan or a Brady fan, but he is the go. The guy is just phenomenal, amen? But uh, I say those things jokingly, but uh, come. It's going to be a wonderful time, amen? Invite your family. Invite some friends. Invite a neighbor. Amen, but it's, it's just going to be an awesome time in the presence of the Lord uh, that day. Amen. So how many are ready to receive this morning? Amen. And uh, I, I just want to pray. So I just want you to just bow your heads with me uh, this evening before we do anything else. Amen. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming into your house tonight, God, to gather together corporately as a body of believers, God, to worship you, to give you glory and honor, God, for who you are. Because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. God, you are everything. So we thank you and we ask tonight, God, for your spirit to move. Father, we didn't come just to gather and sing a few songs, God. We come because we need your presence. We need, God, you. We need a move. We need a move. We need a move, God. I need a move, God. Every man here needs a move. Every woman, every person in this place, we need a move of your presence here tonight. So we invite you, have your way. Do what you do, Father. Do what you do best and change us, transform us by the power of your anointing, God, and by the power of your word. We just thank you tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. amen. How many know that in this life that we are living today that, man, there's so many people, even in Christianity, that are pursuing things. How many are in pursuit of something? Y'all lying tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, man. We're all, we're all pursuing something. Whether it's a, you know, a better job, but we're pursuing a, a raise, we're pursuing, a, we're pursuing something. Can somebody say amen? We're pursuing a... A, a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a wife, a husband. Come on, somebody. We're all in pursuit of something in this life that we live. And that's all good, amen, to have a ambition and, and drive to pursue, whether it's a better career, whether it's a, uh, whatever it is that you're pursuing tonight, there's nothing wrong with that. Can somebody say amen? amen. Has anybody here ever been in a, involved in a high-speed chase? He says, my brother Cameron. And he wasn't the one being chased. I'm just setting the record straight. That way, because he raised his hand like, yeah, so he wasn't the, the uh, accused or whatever. Hallelujah. Uh, so, but besides Cameron, anybody else? I mean, you probably don't want to wait. Raise your hand in this probably crowd, you know, like uh, uh, that, that you have. But, you know, I read a story, and I want to read it to you just kind of as a foundation to my message tonight, because we're all pursuing something in life, but a man was driving down the street minding his own business on his way to a hospital visit. He became aware that some driver was right on his back bumper, weaving back and forth, his engine roaring, his horn blowing. Somebody was in a big hurry. Well, as he rounded the little curve, this driver suddenly shot around me, he said. He hit the curve and drove right up on the sidewalk at breakneck speed. In fact, he was in such a hurry that he managed to put a six-foot wide car through a five-foot space between a telephone pole and a stone wall. Hubcaps and mirrors and door handles went flying, but he didn't stop. Wow. 
What could possess somebody to do this? Then I heard the siren, he says. Not far behind both of us was a police officer giving chase, blasting on his horn, roaring his engine, and also driving at breakneck speed. But at least it was on the street surface. He had plenty of room since yours truly was having his anxiety attack over on the left side of the street. So that was it. So that was the reason a man puts his car through such punishment, he says, leaving spare parts along the way. So that was it. The long arm of the law was in full pursuit. The driver had only one thing in his mind, and that was to escape recklessly, foolishly, useless, not thinking about anything, but he just wanted to run. I never saw either car again, probably because when I got moving, I don't think I got about 20 miles per hour, but of this I am reasonably sure, he says, that the pursuit was successful. Given the condition of the car being chased and knowing that the police officer had surely called for backup, the guy got caught. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. That pursuit, however long it took, I am sure was finally successful. Now, I want to talk about a different pursuit. And it's, you know, nothing like this kind of a pursuit that we're thinking of, but it's an equally intense pursuit that's going on in our lives. And it's this, that God is pursuing our lives. God is pursuing you. Look at your neighbor. I'm going to get you awake somehow tonight. Look at your neighbor and say, God is pursuing you. And it's intense. So I think there's some of us in here that have. We just don't want to say nothing. Hallelujah. That We know what a high-speed chase is. But anyway, he's in pursuit. That is the greatest pursuit of our lives. Not just him pursuing you, but us pursuing him. Can somebody say amen? So think of this. Think of scripture. What does the Bible say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Everybody say first. Seek ye first, not secondary. It's not last on your priority list. He's first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The thing is this, so we forget the other part. And his righteousness. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what does it say? And all these things will be added unto you. I don't know what those things are. All I know is when you put him first, you seek his righteousness. You're hungering and thirsting after his righteousness. Scripture doesn't, doesn't only say that you shall be filled, but he is going to add and he will bless unto your spiritual life. See, all too often we think of blessing as the material. And those are blessings, don't get me wrong. The material, the money, the finances. How many need more finances? Come on, let's be honest. How many can say, man, God, I could use a miracle of my money. I believe you could do that if you seek him first. And his righteousness. And again, those things that he adds, I don't know what they are, but if they're coming from God, I'll tell you what, I know that they're good. They are good. So it's placing him first, uh, amen, his righteousness, it's seeking him. The pursuit is the most important thing ever. Can somebody say amen? So let me, let me tell you this. Right now, and I've used this analogy before years ago in messages that I've preached, but if I were to tell you right now that, you know, somewhere in this building is a million dollars. Whoever finds it gets it. Okay, yeah, exactly. We, 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 this service is over. We're in pursuit. We're going to go seek, and I'm going to join you. Hallelujah. And no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, we probably would. Think about that. And because a lot of times in life, we seek things and we pursue things that are not as important as the spiritual things. We're in hot pursuit. Can somebody say amen? And we want and we want and we want and there's nothing wrong with that. I believe that, you know, now there's a difference between, there's a big difference between needs and wants. Come on, somebody. There's a lot of times I can go shopping and I don't need it, but I want it. Anybody like me? Any impulse shoppers here? 
I don't need it, but I want it. There's a big difference. We need to be involved in this pursuit. Can somebody say amen? Now, I want to read a, our opening scripture. If you could pull that up, uh, Isaiah. You know, because when I read scripture, the Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. Come on, somebody. And I, I want to be honest and, I, and, and kind of get you a little involved here. I, like, I love doing this. But how many here can be honest and say, man, I know there's been times in my life where I know God, in hindsight, that God was speaking to me, but I just kind of, I don't want to say in an irreverent way that you disregarded it, but you knew it was him, but you just didn't quite give it the attention that you knew he wanted you to give it. Come on, somebody. He spoke to you. He's trying to get your attention, and you just kind of were so distracted with the pursuit of something else. So this is the story in the book of Samuel, chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 1, where the Lord is trying to speak to him. How many know this story? And it's almost like he doesn't realize it's God. Let's just get into it. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, <coughs> excuse me, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli. Think about it. The Lord's calling him, doesn't realize it's the Lord, and he runs to Eli, and he says, here I am, for you have called me. And he said, I did call. Lie down again. So he went, and he lay down again. Then the Lord called yet again. Samuel. I mean, think of this with me. He's calling him Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli yet again. And he said, here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call, my son. Go, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. So I want you to understand this. Nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him at that time. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. How many ever feel like Samuel? Mentirosos. <laughs> he called him a third time, so he rose and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived, he realized, that the Lord had called the boy. And this is what he says. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down for the fourth time, and it shall be. If he calls you, that you must say. Think about it. He's instructing him. This is what you need to say. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. His desire, church, I'm telling you tonight, is to speak into your life. But you have to hear his voice. You have to hear his voice. And it doesn't matter. He can speak to you at any time of the day. When you first get up in the morning, when you first rise up, he can wake you up at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Has he ever done that to any of you here? He'll wake you up, and you have to respond. When he's speaking, amen, you have to respond. Lord, speak. Your servant hears. What is it that you want to speak into my life? What is it that you want to reveal to me? What is it that you need for me to see? Can somebody say amen? So you and I, sometimes this is what happens. We're driving at breakneck speed throughout this life. The busyness of life. We got work. We got kids. We got 
school. We got to get them ready. We got all these things to do. Come on, somebody. I mean, come on, who lives a busy life? We all do in some way or another. And we're driving and we're going and everything is important. I'm not saying they're not. I'm not saying your family's not. I'm not saying that your job isn't. I'm not saying any of those things are. Can somebody say amen? But sometimes we get so caught up in the chase and in the pursuit of life and we're not pursuing him. Can somebody say amen? He's pursuing us. Let me tell you a great book you need to read. Anybody ever hear of Tommy Tenney? Right? He wrote a book, two books, actually. One's God Chasers. How many God Chasers do we have in the house? And then the second one is God Finders. Because if you chase him, you'll find him. If you pursue him, you'll run into him. Can somebody say amen? It's, it's the pursuit. These young men that Pastor Solomon called up here, let me tell you something. It's in the pursuit. Every one of us here, but it's in the pursuit. Everything is revealed in the pursuit. As we pursue him, as we place him first, amen, nothing is more important than the pursuit. Can somebody say amen once again? So like this man that was running or being pursued in the story doesn't make any sense. But he done it anyway. In our spiritual lives, some of the things that we pursue don't make any sense. But we do it anyway. And all too often, let me be honest with you, we're chasing the wrong things. We're chasing the wrong things. We're chasing the wrong things. Oh, somebody say, Lord, help us. Knowing that God is pursuing us, we run sometimes. Whether because of fear or the unknown, whatever it is. You have no idea of what God's going to do. You're almost afraid of it. But we run and we run the pursuit. And the thing I love about God is he's relentless in his pursuit. He's relentless. He seeks me. He convicts me. Come on, somebody. And it's almost like when I feel I'm in a rebellious way or I'm mad or I'm upset because of circumstances, man, thank God for his love and his pursuit because he doesn't relent. He doesn't give up on us. How many are thankful for that tonight? How many have failed this week? Let's be honest. Come on, let's be real honest. How many have failed this week? And he still loves you. And he still pursues you. See, this pursuit is about a love relationship. Come on, somebody. And you can't be involved in this love relationship, this pursuit as he's pursuing us, without this. See, this is a love letter. Anybody ever write a love letter to somebody? Bunch of liars again. Hallelujah. We're all teenagers once. Come on, somebody. And, you know, when we're, come on, think about it. When we're pursuing somebody and we're, we're, we're all happy and just in love. Come on. Come on. Anybody been there? Let's be honest. I've been in love before. Anybody else here? How many in love right now? <laughs> Y'all married people better be in love. Hallelujah. So think about that. When you first met your significant other or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, man, we'd talk on the phone for hours. It'd be three or four. And come on, somebody. Anybody remember those days? Carter, put your hand down right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man, we'd do anything. I remember when I was a teenager, man, I had a girlfriend that I would walk for miles. I, maybe we talked about this story before. I, I, I can't remember what happened to my leg. I broke my leg. I don't know what I've done. And I had a cast. I didn't care if it was snowing. Come on, somebody. And I'd be, I'm going to go check out my lady, man. I'm limping all over the place. <laughs> going up fountain, that big old hill. Come on, somebody. 
I'm going. I'm going. It took me two hours in the snow, but I'm going because I was in hot pursuit. Come on, somebody. You know, and this is why I say to these young men that Pastor Solomon called up, because if I could go back to those days when I was pursuing the things that didn't matter, come on, somebody, and I can go back and know what I knew now, man, I tell you what, man, my life, I would have avoided so much stuff, amen, but I, but I can't do that, but God has still been good. Can somebody say amen? But you young men, you young ladies, you can avoid a whole lot of drama in your life and unnecessary pursuits if you seek him first and you pursue him, come on, somebody. I said you pursue him and allow him to catch you. Let him, let him catch up to you. He's chasing you, and he won't give up. Let him be your everything. Come on, somebody. In, in your marriage, let him be your foundation. Let him be the cornerstone in which you build. Come on, somebody. Those are in new relationships, maybe not married yet or whatever it is. I'm speaking to you. Let him be the foundation. Come on, somebody. You pray for one another. Ooh, Lord, help us. It's in the pursuit. Can somebody say amen? But don't run from the pursuit. Don't run. So sometimes in our spiritual lives, like the driver in this story, we self-destruct. Come on, somebody. As we run, and we do it just to save. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've been there. I've been there. There was a season in my life not too long ago where I was literally home. Home, home, home. How many love home? I love home. But I began to hate mine, hallelujah. And I'm not saying my family. Don't get it twisted, hallelujah. But I was home, literally, alone, by myself, for almost three years. Isolation will take you away from the pursuit. Isolation will kill the pursuit. Wanting to do it on your own will kill the pursuit. You need mentors. You need spiritual mentors. Come on, somebody. Not a worldly mentor. Not your worldly friends. Come on, somebody. But a, a mentor that will speak life into you. That will speak the things of God into your soul. Because I got caught up, man. I tell you what, and I couldn't because of injury, and I'm not going to get into all that. Because I'm blessed now. Hallelujah. I may limp a little bit, but don't ever laugh at me. Hallelujah. Because if I have the mic, I will get back at you. Hallelujah. But... And it wasn't by choice. I was just home. I wasn't busy as I was before with the church or whatever it was. And I was just there. And I knew, I knew, I knew that he was pursuing me. I knew that he was trying to captivate me and capture my attention. But it was just to come on. Everybody had been there. Woe is me. Why, God? Why did that happen? Why is this going on? Why? And he was speaking just like he was. Samuel. Come on, people. I mean, for me, it was Donnie. And, and I'll be honest with you, there was times where it's like, because I was so focused on the circumstances that had that I was faced with, God bless you. God bless you. That we take our eyes off the pursuit. And I remember one night, it was almost this scenario. He was pursuing me. And finally I was like, what? You ever answer God with an attitude? Come on, y'all are flesh just like me. Yeah, I, I, exactly, yeah. But, and it wasn't I wasn't mad, but it was just like, what? And just as God, it clear, 
you're there because you choose to be there. Talk about conviction. And then even after that, I, I even still began to argue, but God, you know what happened to me? You know, you know this, you know that. And I know it's not, I never blamed God. God, it's not your fault. You, I know you understand, but man, man, man. But it was almost like he was speaking, right, stand up. Don't let a setback. Oh, I had a pastor friend that said this. Don't let a setback make you sit back. Come back with the spiritual counterattack. Do something. Can somebody say amen? Do something. So it requires response. The negative of st stuff of life requires spiritual response. Stand up. Stand up. Can somebody say amen? You have to rise up and say, no, I am a child of the living God. I serve a big God. God does have more for me. God has greater things are coming into my life. Can somebody say amen? And you get back in your lane and you get in the pursuit. Some of us are in the wrong lane. Can somebody say amen? And we're self-destructing real quick because your focus is other things. Do we know who's seeking us? Do we really know who's per, uh, pursuing us? Who's coming after me? God's not just behind me pursuing me. I believe he's in front of me. He's on this side. He's on that side. He's above me. He's everywhere. Can somebody say amen? He's all around. He's with us. And he won't let you go. You know, we're like that kid that we tell, don't touch that stove. And just out of curiosity. Come on, anybody ever done that? Or have grandkids or somebody do that? I'm the guy that be like, go for it. Go, I want to see this. And they just go and psst, they get burnt. And that's what we do in our spiritual lives. And what does scripture say, man? Can a man play with fire and his bosom not be burned? This world, our mentality, our thinking sometimes, come on, somebody, will burn you. Come on. Any overthinkers in the house? It's horrible. If you focus too much on one thing, man, it'll mess you up. So I, I'm looking to, to purchase a new vehicle. And... Uh, I've been online, I've been here, I've been there, and it stressed me out. Anybody ever been there? I was stressed, but I was even with my sister, and she's like, dude, stop looking. You're all messed up, because my focus was so much on one thing, it consumed me. Come on, somebody. I was stressed out. I don't know what I want. I don't, I don't even care anymore. You know, I was just a mess. So I had to refocus. Come on, somebody. Man, we spend too much time thinking about stuff that don't even matter. Don't even matter. What matters is the pursuit. Now, when somebody's pursuing you or chasing you, there's two things you can do tonight. Either you can keep on running, excuse me, hoping to put distance between yourself and your pursuer. I've seen this happen in the life of a believer. Or man, they're just trying to run from God and put as much distance as they can between themselves and God. And they're running. Come on, somebody. Running from God. Running from the pursuer. Or you can go into hiding and hope that he can't find you. Come on. You can't hide from God. You can't run from God. Impossible. You know, I remember years ago, I was, I was just in prayer, and there were some areas of my life that, man, I just needed God's help, but I just felt kind of, everybody ever, ever felt just ashamed. And I'd be in my office, and my office was in my home, and I, I, I'd, I'd have, I had, I had uh, some chairs in there that had some uh, decor pillows on the chairs and whatnot, and I'd get a pillow, and I'd be praying, and I'd put my head on my desk, and I'd almost felt like I needed to hide from God, and I'd put the, the, the pillow over my head, and I'd be sitting there weeping and crying before the Lord, and then I felt dumb because we can't hide from him. Come on, somebody. Can't run from him. And it was almost like, what are you doing, dude? 
He knows everything. He sees all. He knows all. He is all. But see, God will speak to you in the pursuit. But you can't hide. You can't run. So there are two basic responses to God's pursuit. When God comes looking for you, when he comes looking for us, when he comes looking for me and he's pursuing us, either we can keep on running, hoping to put more and more, hoping to put more and more distance between ourselves and him. We can try to hide. Whatever, whatever method you choose tonight, he will catch up to you. And when he does... And he humbles you and he brings you to your knees in humility. He will get your attention. Come on, somebody. I was talking to my oldest son. And uh, uh, some of you know the story. Uh, he uh, uh, just, I mean, they, they raised him in church. They were lo God-loving, instrument-playing boys. And uh, my oldest son, he's the only one that kind of went off astray. But he just got caught up, man, meth and heroin. And his wife died from an overdose. And. Couldn't even go to her funeral. He actually went to DOC for a couple of years. I mean, he was messed up and then lived with guilt. Have you ever lived with guilt? And, uh, and finally, just different circumstances took place in his life. But it was because of the pursuit of God. He felt God. Even in the ugliest circumstances of his life, he always felt like God was still pursuing him. And he literally told me this the other day. He says, Dad, because we were talking about this. I kind of already knew what I was doing. He says, we're talking about the pursuit. It was, it was in the pursuit. He never let go of me. He never let go. Today he's blessed. Hallelujah. Just living for God. I'm thankful. Hallelujah. But it was the pursuit of the love relationship. And when he speaks, we respond. Come on. Those of us that have children, don't you like your kids to respond when you speak? All oh, the parents say, absolutely. Yeah, you better respond. Come on. We want them to respond, right? I just want people to respond to me in general. Hallelujah. Have you ever been talking to somebody and you're like in 10? You're intently speaking into them, and you can tell they're just somewhere else. Don't you want to smack them? I'm just kidding. I'm in the flesh up here. Hallelujah. Don't you want to pray for them? That's frustrating to me. I feel like I'm talking to you. Come on, somebody. Hello? Husbands, we do this to our wives. I'm not married. I don't know why I'm saying that. Husbands, you do this to your wives. <laughs> Maybe that was prophetic. I don't know. Hallelujah. I'm going to the marriage retreat. I'm signing up. Hallelujah. No. Um, but we do. Come on, think about it. See, these are opportunities for you women and wives to say amen. <laughs> but when God speaks, I said when God speaks, think about this. We think sometimes that, man, God's going to speak the greatest and the best and the most on Wednesdays and Sundays. I believe God will speak the best when you're alone in your prayer closet. When you're on your knees, humbly convicted before him, he will speak, he will show you, he will reveal, he will change you, he will transform you. Come on, somebody. It's in the hiding place. It's in the secret hiding place. Let me tell you something, I, and I think I've said this before too. The greatest moments of my, of my life is when I've been by myself, on my knees, weeping before God. And literally saying, I am not getting up from here. I will not move from here until you prove yourself real, until you touch me. There's times he's done it in an hour. There's times it's taken six. But it's in the pursuit. What are you chasing today? Come on, somebody. Because he's not going to give up. Can somebody say amen? I said he's not going to give up. And then some people run deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the wounds, into their self, into the wilderness of their life. They run from God by pouring themselves into a, a, a dissolute, faithful life, indulging themselves, ignoring God's
commands, ignoring the call. I remember, how many remember the old answering machines? I guess the old folks, hallelujah. Us older folks, hallelujah. You know, but we remember answering machines. I remember a friend of mine, uh, uh, Evangelist Victor, uh, Vincent Margolis, I'm sorry. He came to me one time. We were in church, and, and I was contemplating, man, should I, you know, uh, I think Pastor Omar had already asked me, you know, we want to send you to launch a church out back into Colorado. And, and uh, he came up to me. He goes, hey, bro. And he goes, God really wants me to tell you this. He goes, it may sound silly to you. He goes, but I want to tell you this. And I go, what's that? And he goes, turn off the answering machine and answer the call. And I think for some Christians, we need that. Turn off the answering machine and answer the call. Respond. And he'll show you what that is. In the pursuit, can somebody say amen? And I believe this. The more I try to run from God, the more he pursues me. The more I run, he pursues me all the more. So I can't ignore the voice. Because, again, his sheep know his voice. A bunch of stubborn sheep. Just kidding. Don't get mad at me. Hallelujah. All right, let me tell you a story. My sister owns a ranch down in the San Luis Valley. And one of the things that they do is they raise sheep. There's any given time they have between 600 and 1,000 sheep. Yes, I know. It's crazy. And they, they shear them. They sell the wool. They do all this stuff. And lamb chops. I mean, like lamb chops. So they have like eight dogs. And recently they just had two of them. Had 50, between both the puppies, they had 15 puppies. But they have eight dogs because of the ranch. So what happens sometimes is when these sheep, when they're in lambing season, how many know what lambing is? When they're in lambing season, how many know what a borreguero is? Okay, well, Spanish 101 some other time. Uh, so when they're in lambing season and sheep give birth to uh, the, the little lambs, what happens is a lot of times these little lambs will not take to their mother for breastfeeding. So they buy this, it's a certain powder that they get for for the sheep, for, for the little lambs, I'm sorry, for their nutrients and all that stuff. But what happens is this, is when they get a new sheep dog, they feed this dog the same milk that they feed the little lambs. Anybody ever hear this? No son rancheros. You guys ain't ranchers or farmers, I guess. So anyway, so what happens is the dog, the little puppy, now begins for some reason because it's drinking this milk that they give the sheep. And sometimes they'll even give the dogs or the little puppies the same, uh, the milk from the actual sh mom sheep or whatever you want to call it. The mom sheep, hallelujah, there we go. And uh, so the dogs will now think like a sheep, act like a sheep. Come on, somebody. So think about it. What you feed yourself will determine how you think. If we think like the father, if we come on somebody. So now these dogs are crazy because they'll sit by her and they won't move until she says go. That's obedience. Let me say I, could need, I need some of that. And then another thing is this, is they will sense out of all these sheep They'll sense, these dogs, it's crazy, the, and I've seen this in action, they'll sense when one has gone astray. And they'll sit there looking at her like, you know, they're not pointing little nipple paws like I am, you know. But they're trying to get her attention, and they're trying to, eh, to go get the one. Come on. It's so spiritual, man. And then when she says, go... He's gone. And they'll go get the one. I mean, there's such spiritual significance when we think of that and us as God's sheep. When I say that I mean God's people, you all know what I'm saying here. If you're not saved, we are it's just a terminology in the word of God. And sheep are stubborn. Somebody say, Lord, help us. 
And there's something there, though. Just like God will leave the 99 and go for the one. The lost one. That's what he's doing. That's what he wants to do. Because let me tell you something. You could be in church and it doesn't mean you're not lost. You could be here year in, year out. No, be involved, give. Does not mean you're in hot pursuit. Or that you're allowing him to pursue your life. There's a difference. That's religion. Come on, somebody. The more we fight against him, the more he comes after us. He's pursuing that love relationship. And folks, it's real tonight. Can somebody say amen? He came for the lost. He came for the religious. Come on, somebody. He came for a broken humanity. He came in the person of Jesus for you and I. Evaluate yourself just for a second tonight. And just ask yourself, where am I at in this pursuit? Where am I at? Where am I at in this pursuit? As he's pursuing me, am I running? Am I hiding? And am I really pursuing him? Because it's something that needs to be done on a daily basis. Come on, somebody. It's something that you do. I I think the best time to seek the face of God is first thing in the morning. Before you do anything else, before Facebook, before Instagram, before Twitter, before anything at all, get involved in the pursuit. Come on, somebody. It's easy to get involved in the pursuit when we're in a bad place. Oh, Lord, help us. Father, I need you. God, I love you. Oh, my heavenly. Come on, somebody. But I'm talking about pursuing just because I know that I need him in my everyday life. Can somebody say amen? How many are like me that if, I, if I'm not pursuing, if I'm not doing what I know I need to be doing, reading, you know, come on, folks, reading, praying, worshiping, whatever it is, I know me. Come on, somebody. How many know that? Come on. There's only two people that know you the best. One, God, yourself, and if you're married, your spouse. So don't make us go talk to your wife or your husband. Hallelujah. No, I'm just kidding. I have to. We have to. Come on, somebody. Because if not, I'm going to make a mess of things. I'm going to snap on somebody that day. Come on, somebody. I'm going to go off on something somehow. Something's not going to work out because I didn't seek him first. Because when I do, oh, man, it changes everything. It changes everything. Somebody say once again, Lord, help us. If you know me by now, there's a lot of things I'm always going to say in every message. Lord, help us. Lord, help you. Lord, help me. Lord, help us all. Can somebody say amen? God went so far as to climb up upon a cross, church. To climb up upon a cross. For you. The creator of this world, the God who measured the span of the universe by the span of his hand, wants a love relationship with you. Is pursuing you. And yet we find ourselves that we get busy for him. I was going to show a video tonight, and I didn't, but, uh, but I didn't mention it just for a moment. There's a pastor who does a lot of missionary work in China, and he done a, a thing in China, and it was literally with just 22 leaders, pastors, stuff like that in China. Every day, they rode a train for 13 hours to get to this meeting. And in this meeting, he asked them, he said, what would happen if we got caught right now? They said, well, they'll send you back to America. 
but we'll do three years in prison. And they were reading a book of the Bible, and he had taken, I think it was like seven Bibles or something like that, and there was 22 people, so they had to share it. So this little Chinese lady gave her Bible to somebody else, and then she began to recite the Bible. And he, see, he looks at her and says, where did you learn how to do this? She says, in prison. Because all we have is time. So then he asked this, how many of you 22 people have been in prison for the gospel? 18 raised their hands. <coughs> and she said this. Sometimes people will bring in the word of God, just written scriptures, just written on a piece of paper. She goes, Be that, that's why we memorize it. At the end of the service, this woman approached him and said, pray for me. And he asked, what would you like me to pray for? And she said this, so that we would be like you. And he looked at her in a humble way and he says, you don't want to be like us. He goes, you guys ride a train for 13 hours to come. You sat on a hard floor for eight hours to listen to the word of God. He goes, you guys don't have air conditioning with that as yours. He goes, in my country, if we have to drive more than 45 minutes, heck, a half hour, 20 minutes maybe, we won't go. He goes, if we don't have air, uh, air conditioning, heating, and padded seats, he goes, people won't come to my church. He said this, he goes, on average, in every American home or Christian home, there's two Bibles. He goes, you guys memorize scripture from pieces of paper. He goes, don't pray that you would be like us. I pray that we'll be more like you guys. That's humbling. It's humbling. Yet we have the answer. We have the freedoms and the liberties that they do not have. And we find every excuse and reason why we can't. Because I, I will tell you this. There will be a day. And I couldn't tell you when. I have no clue. But I know it's coming. There will be a day that we will not have the freedoms and the liberties that we have now in this country. And it's scriptural. So I've always told people, if you can do it now, when times get rough, what makes you think you'll do it then out of desperation? Come on. The word has to be hidden in our heart. And all that is found in the pursuit. All that is found in the revelation of God, not just his word, but as he reveals himself to me. All those wonderful things. But it happens as I respond. Yes, speak. Your servant hears. And when he asks you to do something, maybe he's not so comfortable that you just can't, well, man, God, this is going to be hard. Let me tell you something. Just respond. It's in the pursuit. The blessing is in the pursuit. Can somebody say amen? And let me tell you another thing. You can't run from God in your goodness. Well, I'm a good citizen. I'm not a lawbreaker. I go to church. I do. Let me tell you something. You can be the best performer. Come on, somebody. Oh, somebody say, Lord, help us. I mean, think about it. The Bible says that not all will enter into the kingdom of God, but only those that do the will of my Father. And I'll tell you something. In the day and age that we live in, there's a whole lot of religion. It's not relationship. It's religious relationship. Even in the church of God today. Even from the pulpit. I know a pastor in this city that literally stole, stood up and told his congregation this. This is real. This was a while back, but it's real. And he said this. You know what, church? 
I'm just at a point where I kind of believe about God, but I just don't think there's a real God. telling you yet we have the answer I mean let me tell you something I've I've been and again I'm not nobody man I'm just nobody but I've been to a lot of churches and and part of a wonderful fellowship for almost 30 years and I will say this God is pursuing this body God is pursuing this body. There's something that God wants to do. If you can't walk in here in every service and feel the presence of God through worship, the word, the prayer, altar call, you're not pursuing. Don't get mad at me. I love even at the, I love every one of you, especially the Bronco fans. I love you to death. Just kidding. But something's wrong. Something has to take place that every time we have an opportunity at home, at church, whatever it is, I'm going to pursue whatever he has for my life. There's nothing greater. There's no amount of money. There's not the best job in the world. There's not the best wife, the husband in the world. And thank God for those things because I know we all want the best wife, the best husband, the best things. And again, God will bless you with that. But the most important thing in your life is the pursuit. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all about the pursuit. So when I was in that place for almost three years, I was camouflaging myself. I was hiding. Because it was rough. But I had to peel back and remove and camouflage. The mask. Too often that, you know, we come in and we we put on our mask right before we walk into the church. Come on, somebody. Y'all mad at me tonight or something? Hallelujah. Because you know why? You know why I asked that? Because I don't care. I'm just kidding. Hallelujah. No, but it, it is, it's truth, guys. It's truth. It's the truth of the word of God became truth in my life. And not that I wasn't living the truth before, but it was a place where focus became, became something else. And to be honest with you, focus became, my injury became my focus. So many things became my focus. It was, it was horrible. And I took my eyes off the pursuit. I took my eyes off of my lover. Came out, Come on, somebody. The lover of my soul, the lover of my heart, the one that saved me, the one that gave his life, the one that done great things in my life. The focus became everything else. So I had to begin to peel back all the junk. And the crazy thing was this, the pursuer never left. He never gave up. He never quit on me. The focus changed. The pursuit changed. Come on, somebody. So I became a Samuel. Somebody say, Lord, help us. And sometimes we just don't want God to get close to us. We have a hard time letting penetrate through the thickets, if you will, of our defenses. And get up close and personal with us. I mean, let me tell you something. If you, I'm going to say this. If you're hiding from God, you're also hiding in the church. Because God has everything to do with the church. Remember, this is his house. Come on, somebody. So we're, if we're hiding from God and running from God, then you're doing the same thing in the church. He wants fellowship with you. Look at your neighbor and say, he wants fellowship with you. He wants an intense, personal, face-to-face 
encounter with you. And you have to say, no more count. There's no, let me tell you something. There's nothing greater than coming to God broken. The Bible actually says that he loves the broken and the contrite heart. Something about brokenness that we think I can't let nobody know. Come on, anybody ever try to hide their brokenness from somebody? Just want, you don't want people to know. Come on, somebody. I'm, I've, I've become very honest. Somebody asked me, if I'm having bad, somebody asked me, how are you doing? I'm not doing well. Pray for me. Hallelujah. Pray for me. Somebody say, Lord, help us. The great thing is this, is you don't have to run anymore. I guess the million-dollar question is this, is will you pursue him? I love this scripture. And it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Psalms 27. Can you pull that up, Isaiah? Psalms 27. I think it's verses 1 through 4. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength, the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me, they ate at my flesh, my enemies and foes. They stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me. My heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this, I will be confident. Verse number four. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That's talking about pursuit. Can somebody say amen? What do you seek tonight? What do you desire? And I'm not talking about the goals and dreams. Man, I think that's awesome. I've encouraged every one of my children to pursue their goals and dreams and life and talents, whatever it is. And I think I pray that those things things come to a place of fruition in their lives and yours, but still the greatest thing is the spiritual things. Can somebody say amen? I want the heart of David. He just had something about him where he always wanted to be in the presence of God. He found his strength in the presence of God. He knew that in the presence of God that there was fullness of joy. We alive tonight. In the oasis of God. Communion with him. I've always wanted to say this. Isaiah, can you pull up Isaiah 40, 31? <laughs> I love the scripture. I've always, it's always been one of my favorites because it's true. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like the eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. But it takes the waiting. I'm going to wait on God. I'm going to pursue him. I'm going to pursue him. I'm going to pursue him. Stand to your feet tonight. Can I share a story with you guys as we stand? Uh, I remember when I first got saved. And I loved God. I, re I really did. But there was just something there where I was, I really didn't want people to know that I was saved. Maybe you've been there. But I was just kind of, 
What will they say? How will they respond? They're going to mock me. Jesus freak. You you know, we've heard it all. And I remember I was in a service and God convicted me. It's almost like you're ashamed of me. And from that night forward, I remember this one we used to have Sunday night services. Hallelujah. I remember, remember Sunday night services. And we'll go to church in the morning, go have lunch, go take a siesta, come back. And there was some services, I'm telling you, we, we'd have church till 11 o'clock at night. And my kids were small, and they turned out okay. Best place to raise them, in the midst of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. From that night, I remember that service. I said, no more. I called every friend back here, that is, because I'm from here. I got saved over there. I didn't care, man. I danced in church. Yes, I used to dance in church. Amen. I couldn't do it now. Hallelujah. I hurt myself. But we dance. We'd, it doesn't matter. Because I learned that I needed to be in pursuit of the one that saved was pursuing me. So maybe you're here tonight. I'm just looking around. I believe we're all saved. So I'm not going to do an altar call for salvation as I'm looking around here. No, I need to. If you're not saved, or maybe you're not where you need to be in your walk with God, you've just kind of fallen away, and you say, you know what? I know that he's pursuing me. I feel his presence. It's not the words that I speak. It's the spirit of the living God that's drawing you. And he wants you. He wants a love relationship with you. If you say that's me, just lift your hand. Anybody here at all, you say that's me before I do anything else. Before I do anything else. Amen. Christians. He's pursuing you. He wants you. In a way that will blow your mind if you respond to his voice. If you just say, yes, Lord. Maybe you're here and you're wrestling with something that he has spoken. And you've kind of disregarded the voice like we hear, see here with Samuel. And you just kind of, you're just not in a place of response but you need to respond. Whatever it is that he's showing you or speaking to you, whatever that is, you need to respond. And another thing is maybe you're here and you just know you're not in your lane. You're not in the lane that you're supposed to be in. And in this hot pursuit like the story You're causing all kinds of destruction because you're running. He wants to capture you. He wants to captivate you. He wants to overwhelm you. He wants to bring revelation into your life. See, God can't do any of that until we say, here I am. You've got my attention. You've pursued me. You caught me. You caught me. And I believe there's people here tonight that you are. You're done running. You're done running. you need to respond to the Lord. Someone open up these altars. And you'd say tonight, you know what? I'm I'm done running. I know there's more. I know there's more. There's more. And I'm not going to run no more. I'm going to stop. And he's got me. It's got, he's got me. So we're going to worship the Lord. I mean, these altars are open. You come. I don't know if it's five of you, one of you. I have no idea. 
But I know God's speaking to his people tonight. And you need to respond to him. God, you got me. You know, let me show this. I'm at a place in my life where I just don't care about anything. I've been through the ringer. I've been blessed. I'm still blessed. Even when I was going through the ringer, I was blessed. I'm preparing a message on the scripture found, I think, I think it's Romans. What shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall peril, shall discord, shall trial, shall people. I mean, we can think of all kinds of things. Nothing. Nothing shall separate you from your pursuit with the Holy One. With the Holy One. So maybe there's more here. You need to respond to the Lord. Amen. You need to respond to the Lord tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.